Hello viewers and welcome to another entry in the Lord of the Rings The Card Game Progression series. My name is Mitch. And I'm Matthew. And today let's evaluate and review the player card contents of the fourth adventure pack of our first expansion cycle, The Hills of Emin Muil. At this point in our card pool, the lore, spirit, and leadership spheres of influence have each already received a Shadows of Mirkwood cycle hero. So today, Matthew, please introduce us to the first post-core set hero for Tactics. So, Tactic's new hero is Brand, son of Bane. He has the Dale trait, 10 threat cost, 2 willpower, 3 attack, 2 defense strength, and 3 hit points. Brand, son of Bane, is ranged and response. After Brand, son of Bane, attacks and defeats an enemy engaged with another player, choose and ready one of that player's characters. Historically, this hero has been for the most part universally panned his art i think leaves a little bit to be desired and on top of that i think his ability for a lot of players was sort of dead on arrival and i think that's because a big draw of this game is the ability to play it solo uh, i talk a lot on my podcast the great company podcast about how i started the game as a solo player but once uh, a local play group uh, was uh, started up here in my local area around uh, the, the Dwarrow Delph cycle, uh, about halfway through it. I've never looked back, and I've never played solo since. So a lot of players, right, if you're playing uh, one-handed solo, this guy is never doing anything for you. Range doesn't do anything in a solo game if you're playing one-handed, meaning just one deck. Um, Sentinel doesn't do anything either. So... You know, most people just didn't like him because they were never, ever going to use him. Now, fast forward to the future, uh, or present, I should say, and man, is this guy baller, if you're playing multiplayer. I have seen him do so many awesome things and getting extra action advantage out of heroes that in a three- or four-player game, which is almost exclusive what I play, he is stellar. But outside of a, a three- or four-player game, I, I'm not even sure he's all that great in a two-player game, but in three- or four-player game where there's lots of enemies being revealed, lots of people have enemies, lots of heroes that could benefit from action advantage, I really do think he's top-notch. But on the flip side, I understand why some players wouldn't necessarily ever use him. Yeah, Brand was certainly a very divisive character when he was first introduced. A lot of people picked up a copy of the core set. They were very interested in the tactics sphere of influence. They wanted to be able to smash apart all the enemies coming off the top of the encounter deck. But people trying to build a mono tactics deck in the beginning quickly discovered that they totally floundered when it came to questing. They couldn't conjure up a lot of willpower. Legolas added progress tokens, but the amount of threat that you gained was just way too much, and uh, a solo tactics deck just could not hack it in a core set in Shadows of Mirkwood environment. A lot of players were clamoring for a two or more willpower tactics hero, because some people like their sphere purity, and uh, Brand offers up a couple of willpower in the form of a tactics hero. Where that kind of goes wrong, though, is like you touched on, he's not exactly solo friendly because his ability requires other players anywhere on the table, and uh, he's kind of another jack-of-all-trades hero. He's 10 threat, but it's associated with a reasonable willpower value, a respectable attack value, but he's not exactly a slouch when it comes to defending either, and he's got a decent pool of hit points being a human. Uh, there's no Dale synergy, so it seems like Brand is kind of trying to do a lot, but he isn't necessarily accomplishing much. He definitely is a bit of a late bloomer in that long after high school, as you well know, Matthew, Brand <laughs> eventually does develop from an ugly duckling into a, a beautiful swan, or he undergoes a metamorphosis and does become a beautiful butterfly. But back in the day, there's just not that much you can do with his ability. Uh, like, you have to have another player, that other player has to be engaged with an enemy, Brand has to either be able to kill it himself, or with the assistance of the other player's characters, 
or you have to have ranged characters to attack with Bran to destroy that enemy. The other player has to have a character that you can actually derive some benefit from readying. Like, it's great if they have Barovor or Glaowine so that they can draw cards, or that they have Daughter of the Nimrodel so that they can do healing, but if you're just the kind of individual that does pickup games at a local store or something like that, Brand just seems like a huge risk to include in a deck, because even if you can ready characters, there's no guarantee there's any benefit whatsoever from doing so. So over time, there are going to be more and more uh, uses for readying characters. And I will point out that it is characters, it's not heroes. So allies could be readied. So we'll see some really nice uh, events in the future that it might be nice to have some, some readied allies. Uh, we'll talk more about that when that card appears. But with that said, um, there are still other things, even with the current card pool up until Brand's uh, time, that are helpful. So Hinnomarth Riversong, for example, maybe scrying the top of the encounter deck is another one that could work. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of ways at this point to boost Brand's attack to make sure that this is consistent. Uh, Dwarven Axe is sort of the staple. Dunedain Mark, one of our new cards from this cycle, could also help make sure that his ability is going off. But as Mitch mentioned, you know, any amount of ranged characters can help. So if you're sort of playing a ranged deck, uh, perhaps combining all of your ranged characters to snipe over to someone else means they can ready their character. Even something like Quick Strike, perhaps, could let Brand uh, ready a character on the other side, and then they can now ready to defend something else, or, you know, if they committed everyone to questing. So there's a lot of uses for him. Some of them at this point, I think, are niche, but eventually, I really do think he's an undervalued hero that uh, whenever I see him on the table uh, currently, it's really, really beneficial. But I totally understand why Brand has stuck in the binder for so many players, probably up until this day. Yeah, I think for quite a while, at least insofar as the progression series is concerned, uh, he is going to be outshined by Legolas, but over time there's going to be more and more compelling reasons to eventually fish Brand out of the binder and, uh, you know, toss him out there onto the table and uh, determine his overall quality. Uh, you did happen to mention Quick Strike, and I think that's something you might be able to do with Brand, as you and I have had happen before, is you could maybe have Gimli with a large amount of damage on him use Quick Strike to destroy some large enemy or some medium sized enemy, and then maybe Brand could attack something smaller, end up readying Gimli, and then uh, maybe Gimli could attack again and destroy something else. But that certainly requires a lot of enemies to be in play and engaged with players. And if Matthew, for instance, is the player running Gimli, then for Brand son of Bane to be able to ready another player's powerful tactics characters, maybe multiple players would need to include tactics heroes in their decks. And uh, I guess it's also worth noting, in regard to readying characters, attacking is the last thing that you do, so it's outside of Quick Strike to ready a defending character... It just seems like it, uh, at this point in the card pool, Brand leaves a little bit of something to be desired, and even though he's another printed ranged hero that enables players to run effects like Reign of Arrows and things like that, uh, I just think it's going to be quite some time before we ever consistently use Brand, and uh, I suppose I'll just be curious to see what exactly happens with him. Uh, but, Matthew, I guess, what else is in this adventure pack? So up next is our first leadership card. It is an ally, and it is Keen-Eyed Tuke. Uh, Keen-Eyed Tuke costs two, has one willpower, zero attack, zero defense strength, and two hit points. Keen-Eyed Tuke is, of course, a hobbit and response. After Keen-Eyed Tuke enters play, reveal the top card of each player's deck. Action. Return Keen-Eyed Tuke to your hand to discard the top card of each player's deck. Uh, well, uh... Interesting card, uh, Ket, <laughs> uh, you know, as it is so belovedly known on Cardboard of the Rings. Uh, what a worthless card. Um, I mean, I guess in the modern card pool, perhaps he's a little bit better because there are now things that actually can only be played from your discard pile. There are things that, you know, uh, you know, or you can pull things back from a discard pile with some fancy tricks and stuff. 
But at the time that he's released, I think we all sort of scratched our heads a little bit. The only real use that I can think of him in the context of the card pool that he came out with is a lot of times when I'm building decks, I put in three copies of everything. So my deck is consistent, so I get those power cards or whatever card I happen to be looking for. But once you've gotten that card, if it's unique, then you can't play the other copies. And so that's what makes Eowyn so worthwhile because you can pitch to her, but you can only pitch once. And so this is a way that if you can see the top card of your deck, and let's say it's a card you don't want, then you could be, I don't want this card, so I can just get rid of it. And it, it's a way to sort of thin your deck and get to what you really need more quickly. The problem, though, going back to what I was saying earlier, is that I'm a multiplayer player. And my gosh, would I be pissed if someone else played this card, and I've got a great card on the top of my deck, and they're like, ha, 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 I don't want my card. We're going to ditch everybody else's. So I have never seen anyone play this card. Uh, the Hobbit trait has been fleshed out have still never seen this guy get any better because he doesn't really benefit hobbits particularly. Um, so I don't really have a whole lot to say about this one. Never ever seen it play. Not really sure what the designers were intending. Uh, I think it's more beneficial in solo than multiplayer, but gosh, I mean, two for uh, one willpower, it can soak up maybe a little bit of damage uh, with the two hit points, but mm, what do you think, Mitch? Well, I've got to describe this as a bit of a head-scratcher, where it's one of those yeah. cards where we end up talking a lot about it, because we kind of have to really struggle to justify its existence. So, obviously, knowledge is always power, so if you know what's coming up next on top of your deck, and if your allies also know what they're going to be drawing, uh, maybe it'll help you to make a decision like uh, you could say, okay, I really need this one leadership resource for some kind of card effect, uh, but I could invest in a campfire tales to have everybody dig for some combo piece that we really need, some sort of... Uh, contingency plan to get us out of some emergency situation. If you know for sure that you're going to be getting that card that you need, that's great. Uh, but that might not happen, and the situation I just described isn't exactly common. If you do have an absurd amount of resources, just like you said, you can mill through your deck, you can essentially kind of cycle through a bunch of cards. Uh, if Glowen, Theodrid, Steward of Gondor are all accumulating a bunch of resources for you, uh, you could, say, spend two, put Keen-Eyed Took into play, you look at the top card of your deck, if you don't like it, you could bounce him to hand, discard it, invest another two resources to play him again, and see what the next card is. Uh, if you're just getting rid of extra uniques you don't need, or cards that you don't need in that situation, that's not a big deal at all. But as is obvious, like you touched on, if other players have awesome cards, then you're really doing the entire table a disservice by bouncing uh, your ket in and out of play. I do like that it's some on-demand readying of Prince Imrahil, like maybe he defends and then you attack something with the keen-eyed took, return him to hand, and then Imrahil is ready to attack something else. But there's just not enough benefit, really, from uh, returning him to hand. I mean, even if you defend against an enemy with the Keen-Eyed Took, if you choose uh, to return it to hand after it's been declared as a blocker, then all of a sudden that attack is undefended, and you have to assign a bunch of damage to one of your heroes. This no longer combos with Horn of Gondor. Sometimes encounter cards punish you when uh, characters leave play. And even though this might be an opportunity to uh, trigger Valiant Sacrifice, because again, just like for Imrahil, it's a character leaving play, I don't know about this one. I too have never really seen anybody use it. I'm not excited to use it myself. And, uh,. I guess that's really all I can think of to say about it. I like it more than Dunedane Quest, but that's kind of the long and short of it. On the flip side, Dunedain Quest sticks around, whereas this guy, I mean, I guess you could play him and have him forever, but eh, not a fan. Yeah, I mean, 
The only thing I'd like about an ally over an attachment, and again, it kind of depends on the quest, is uh, sometimes for Gondor allows it to attack for sure. something, right. and uh, maybe Faramir allows it to quest for an additional one. Uh, but you made me think of another point. I mean, Guard of the Citadel can attack for one. This mm -hmm. guy can't. Right. Wandering Took, which granted is in a different sphere, has a point of attack and a point of defense. It just seems like the Ket, unfortunately, is one of these kind of trash tier cards. Yeah. So maybe someone can convince us otherwise in the comments. But until then, uh, I think I'll hold my peace on this one. Right. I, I think the current designers of the game have their work cut out for them to make this a uh, worthwhile card. But perhaps <laughs> they should try. With that said, I think our next leadership event is actually pretty decent, and it's the one-cost rear guard. Quest action, discard a leadership ally to give each hero committed to this quest plus one willpower strength until the end of the phase. I will say that this is a card I don't see played very often. In fact, I'm not sure I've ever seen it played at all. But I do recognize it. I think it's actually pretty good. Um, like some of the other cards we've discussed today, I think this is a card that's better in multiplayer because it's every hero committed to the quest, not just your hero. So in a four-player game, if there's a bunch of heroes committed to the quest, they're all getting extra willpower, and you could discard that pesky Kenai Took to trigger this ability. Uh, the other thing that I think is fairly decent here is that the ally does not have to be ready. It's not, uh, you know, exhaust and discard like some of our other cards that we'll see um, other allies. So I like that. I, you know, I actually think it's, it's pretty decent. It's one that, you know, I'm thinking, huh, you know, I've never used it. This would rarely be a bad draw because getting extra willpower is good provided you have an ally to, to get rid of. I think... Uh, the first thing that comes comes to mind is Snowborn Scout, because once he's placed his progress, he's not doing a whole lot. Right. Um, he certainly can chump block, but if you don't need to chump block, maybe you're more the questing deck, not the defending deck, then that this gives a great use for him outside of placing that progress token. So I think it's really, really good. Yeah, I've got to say, Rear Guard isn't a card that I've seen played much. I definitely did not care for it when I was uh, still a burgeoning LOTR LCG player. Back during my formative years, I really underestimated <laughs> just how powerful this card can be. But it gets better the more players there are in a game. Perhaps the biggest thing holding it back is that you have to discard a leadership ally. And there just aren't a lot of good choices. Uh, after this video, Matthew and I are going to be playing through the actual the hills of Emin Wheel scenario, and even though that's a quest that asks you to bring a lot of willpower to bear, this isn't a card I really considered, just because leadership allies are such a scarce commodity. Son of Arnor costs three, Faramir costs four, and I definitely don't want to discard him unless I absolutely have to, and apart from that, you've got Kenai Took, which I'm loath to include in a deck, <laughs> and then other expensive options like that. I'm not playing Brock Iron Fist, and I definitely don't want to discard something six cost for this. But there are more and more cheap leadership allies in time, and if you get to the point in a given scenario where you really need to uh, overcome location lock, clear out an active location, progress between quest phases, or close out a scenario, this is an incredibly powerful card, because in a four-player game, you could be sending 12 or more willpower for one resource to the quest, and you can play multiple copies of this. Uh, even though I wouldn't like to discard Faramir through this card, you could use Faramir's ability, and then if you really, really need to make progress, you could discard Faramir and then play a second of the, you know, two or three copies that you've got in your deck. So it's, uh, it's certainly a powerful finisher, and uh, it's a very potent effect compared to something similarly costed like Secret Paths or Radagast's Cunning, but you're not always going to be in a situation where you can afford to be sending a lot of heroes to the quest, and uh, the more cards that I can kind of build up my board state as opposed to dismantle it, uh, I naturally gravitate away from cards like this one. 
The only other thing I can really think of to mention is that since this is another character leaving play, it'll of course ready Prince Imrahil, and for that reason you may as well commit him to the quest, and then discard your ally so that he's ready during staging so that he doesn't take damage, but this does conflict with Faramir because it leaves you with one less ally that's maybe getting some sort of willpower benefit, and uh, if you can scry, if you know exactly what's coming off the top of the encounter deck, then uh, you can more safely use a card like this one. But I underestimated it before. I certainly won't do so from now on. So it's uh, pretty cool. But Matthew, what's up next in the tactics sphere? So we get a new ally for the tactics sphere, Descendant of Thorindor. He costs four, one willpower, two attack, one defense strength, and two hit points. Descendant of Thorndor is a creature and an eagle, and he cannot have restricted attachments. Response. After Descendant of Thorndor enters or leaves play, deal two damage to any one enemy in the staging area. So we get another eagle, and I love the eagles. A little bit on the pricey side, I mean, four resources is quite a bit for tactics, which has limited resource acceleration, particularly with the nerfed uh, Horn of Gondor. But I will say it's kind of a fun ab ability. I just sort of picture this eagle like dive bombing goblins and stuff, and that's super fun. I, I think perhaps this ally is best used with sneak attack. That way you can very quickly deal two damage to one enemy, um, and then at the end of the phase pop them back out with sneak attack, and so maybe dealing a total of four to one enemy or two spread across. So that could help with questing or just clearing out the staging area before you have to defend against the enemies or something. Um, so it, it's a pretty pretty fun ally. Uh, certainly having creatures makes some quests easier. Uh, we, we played a few where we needed creatures or eagles, uh, although I would be loath to discard this guy to some of those nasty treacheries. Um, if you're playing an eagle deck, I don't really see any reason not to include him. He gives a little bit of willpower um, plus some damage, which is nice, and he sticks around, unlike Gandalf, who doesn't. And then if you need emergency direct damage or something, he could doesn't defend all that well, which is nice, because then he dies and pops some damage on something else. So, I don't know, I, th I think it's a pretty fun card, but not necessarily for every deck. Yeah, I think it's a very cool card, but it probably is a little bit better in theory than in practice. Like, if you don't have enemies in the staging area and Descendant of Thorndor enters play or leaves play, it doesn't have any eligible targets to take damage. So it is great with sneak attack. I don't dispute that for a moment. It pops in, it kills an enemy, maybe it removes threat from the staging area. At the end of the phase, before travel, it bounces back to your hand and maybe it damages or kills something else. So if you're fighting a bunch of weenie enemies coming off the encounter deck, it's more effective than Gandalf in a sense. And uh, if you have it defend as a chump blocker and die and then it pings something else in the staging area, that's fantastic. But I just think a lot of the time you're going to be in situations where you'd like to resolve that ability, but you're just not going to have any targets for it. I do think it's prohibitive expensive. It's maybe not the best eagle that we've seen thus far, but uh, it definitely has the coolest ability, in my opinion. Uh, Thalon deals a point of damage to enemies as they're revealed from the encounter deck, and this adds to that. It's a great setup or uh, just synergistic piece uh, to combo with the likes of Swift Strike or Gondorian Spearman so that you can make sure that enemies die while they're in the process of still attempting to resolve an attack. And uh, this is our fourth Eagle trait card, so it actually makes the Eagles Are Coming worth playing. If you include three copies of the Eagles Are Coming, of Winged Guardian and Landraval, and then Descendant of Thorindor here, uh, the equivalent value of the Eagles are coming is uh, 1.122, which means that it's like an extra 12% of a card uh, that the Eagles are coming is worth. So whenever you end up playing that event, you on average draw like 
out of every 100 times that you play it, uh, 12 out of those times, I guess you would draw two cards as opposed to just one. So that gets even better. And even if you're not running three copies of Landreval, even if you're just running two copies, it still makes the Eagles are coming worth playing. And as that's a free event, it doesn't cost any resources, and it generally is going to be drawing you a card you know, the fewer cards that you have in your deck, the more consistent you're going to be able to get all your combo pieces online, so I just think there's a lot to like about this card, with the exception of its price. Uh, the point of defense is cute, but it's not doing a whole lot. The same thing goes for willpower. Uh, just like the Bjorning Beekeeper, I think that four is a little much to pay for just one paltry point of uh, willpower strength, but, I mean... Have you had much experience with this one, Matthew? I mean, neither of us were particularly warm in regard to the Bjorning Beekeeper, but have you had much success with our descendant here? I have built eagle decks before, and I think I always include one or two copies of the descendant. I typically don't do three. Uh, Radagast in your deck, even though Radagast costs five, can start generating a bit more resources to make playing this guy a, a bit easier. So outside of a sort of eagle-themed deck, I definitely don't use this character. But in those confines, uh, I think it's fun to have him hit the, the table. So do I use him a ton? No, I've really only ever used him in one deck, and that was exclusively with eagles. But, you know, it's, it's more for, I think, the fun factor than it is the power I must win the scenario at any cost factor. For sure. And uh, to all the Born Aloft fans out there, use that uh, as an at-will means of bouncing him back to hand, deal out your damage. Maybe you even ready Prince Imrahil. So, very cool card. Uh, I look forward to maybe seeing what it does in the progression series. Uh, but uh, Matthew, I know you're personally a huge fan of our next card, so what do we have left? It's probably my favorite. It is the zero-cost event. Maneldor's Flight. Uh, its action reads, choose an eagle ally, return that character to its owner's hand. I mean, certainly it could be used with Descendant of Thorndor if you need a way to get rid of him that isn't defending or something, totally. or you didn't have sneak attack. Outside of that, I don't really think there's a ton of eagle allies you're going to want to return to your hand, because a lot of them don't have enters or leaves play abilities. So... It's just an odd card. Uh, it's, again, a, perhaps simply made for Descendant of Thorndor, um, or at least largely made, which is why it comes out in this pack. But uh, you have to pay the initial four cost to get it to happen right away, and then you pull it back, and if you can pay four again, uh, I don't know. I mean, I can see its use in that particular sense, but that is a lot of resources to pump into something where I'd rather play Sneak Attack if I had access to leadership cards in my deck. Uh, it's just a little bit more efficient uh, use of uh, our Eagle ally here. So, um, yeah, don't really like it. Even in my Eagle decks, I don't use it. Yeah, I guess my experience is that uh, you and I are, it's a bit of a struggle sometimes to scrounge together one tactics resource, let alone eight or 12 or 16 during one turn. So, I mean, yeah, bounce uh, Descendant of Thorndor back to hand, but what else are you going to do with this card? It's like a more restrictive event version of Born Aloft. So depending on the scenario, maybe it's ever so slightly less likely to be removed from play by a shadow card or a treachery or something like that. But you know, what exactly is it doing? I guess Landreval maybe takes a bunch of damage, and then you return a five-cost ally to your hand, and then you have to play him again, and then if Landreval isn't in play, you're not gonna derive any benefit from his, like, effect if a hero is destroyed. And uh, something that players had thought a lot about is originally they had thought, okay, Winged Guardian, it's got a forced reaction where after it successfully resolves a defense, you've got to pay a resource or discard it. Maybe you could use Maneldor's Flight if you don't have a resource and you could just return it to hand. But our developers have long ago clarified that forced effects always happen before anything else. So you 
resolve your defense, you have that forced effect, you have to pay the resource or discard it, and then you've got your action window to use Maneldor's flight. So there's really not any good reason outside of Descendant of Thorindor to put this in a deck. Uh, even if you were returning an ally to hand, it... It doesn't count as being destroyed, so there's no, like, Horn of Gondor synergy. You know, it's it's an ally leaving play, but if you want to just at will bounce allies back to your hand, run Born Aloft. I mean, this is an event, so you can play at any time, not just the uh, planning phase, but it just seems like this is an absolutely terrible card. I've never, ever, ever seen anyone use it. Uh, talk about cards that were absolutely dead on arrival. Not only was this dead on arrival, but I just don't see this card ever being worth inclusion in a deck, uh, really almost under any circumstance. Yeah, we only get one more eagle after the end of this cycle, and that happens to be Guahir, um, who does have an enter play ability, so you might want to pull him back. But again, Guahir costs five, and, and so it's almost worse than Descendant of Thorindor. Um, so until we get relatively inexpensive eagles that either have enters play or leaves play abilities that you would want to sort of have recur, a lot like the Sylvan Elves that we get in a later cycle... Uh, this one's going to be dead. So I, I think this card could become very good under those circumstances. But as is, we don't have inexpensive enters, leaves, play, eagles, uh, you know, with abilities and stuff. So, gosh, I mean, they could make this card really good. I would love to see more eagles. I would love an eagle hero. Uh, I say it all the time. So I would love to make another sort of more modern, more fun eagle deck. I don't think it really holds its own very much currently. So, uh, but short of that, this card is never, ever going to see play. It just bums me out that this, like, to the airy doesn't even have the eagle trait, so you don't even, like, incidentally have the risk of drawing it when you play the eagles are coming. Yeah. So I just really can't see anyone putting this in a deck or having a good opportunity to play it. Well, I think we've spent more than enough time on this particular card, so let's move out of the tactics realm and look at our spirit cards. Up first is an ally, the Rittermark's Finest. Costs two resources, one willpower, one attack, zero defense strength, and two hit points. The Rittermark's Finest is a creature and Rohan. Action. Exhaust and discard the Rittermark's Finest to place two progress tokens on any location. Uh, this was the ally I was alluding to earlier in this particular episode where you have to exhaust and discard, which kind of stinks. Um, so I currently have a Rohan deck that I've been rocking for about a year or two that I sort of tweak every time a new Rohan ally or event or something comes out. And it's a pretty good deck. Uh, this card is in there. But what I find myself doing more often than not is just questing with him, for one. Um, I don't use his ability that often. Uh, because I tend to want the willpower more than I want to pop a location. Uh, that's dependent, of course, on the quest or the location that you're trying to pop. I think it's a great card. Uh, Rohan's sort of sub-theme is allies leaving play and doing something to a location. So it fits very nicely within that particular theme. Um, so good card. I mean, it's in my deck. I use it. It's not particularly flashy. It can you know, be useful in a pinch. I hate that you have to exhaust it. Uh, I wish you could just discard it from play after questing. But, you know, it's one of those things where if you know you need to get rid of a location, you're basically playing two for two progress points. Maybe you got to quest or attack a time or two. So it's a solid ally, if not particularly exciting. Yeah, I, I do think I share your sentiments for the most part. I think it's worth noting that this is the first time we see a creature trait ally outside of tactics. It's our first non-eagle creature, and uh, that means that conflict at the Karak gets easier and easier all the time because uh, a frightened beast is a little bit uh, easier to mitigate the more uh, available allies we have to sacrifice. It's nice that it's greater than 1 HP insofar as the 
Necromancer's Reach being unable to outright eradicate this when it is declared as a questing character, and uh, one attack in the Spirit Sphere is by no means insignificant. So, along with Northern Tracker, you can attack for three, and uh, in my genuine solo experiences, which are normally some combination of like spirit and lore, stuff like that, it really can be a challenge to kill enemies, and uh, little, you know, one or two points of attack here and there do definitely add up. But I do think that uh, until we see the Rohan trait get a little bit more developed, the primary appeal here is that ability, and this strikes me as another puzzle piece card, just because here and there, you and I are going to have to be up against quests where you've got a location with one or two uh, quest points, but it offers a bunch of threat strength. Like in the Hills of Emin Wheel, in that very quest, there's a location, the East Wall of Rohan. It's four threat, but two quest points, so if you know that there's a risk of that coming off the top of the encounter deck, you can hold back your Rittermark's finest. If you reveal that location during staging, prior to quest resolution, you can sacrifice your Rittermark's finest, and then you get rid of four threat. So... Here and there, it's going to be really cool. It works great with Snowborn Scout, Northern Tracker, and all sorts of other effects. Uh, and it can let you overcome nasty locations like the Brownlands that's five threat and one uh, quest point. So combo it with Stand and Fight if you want to use it as many times as possible. Or maybe you want to run Dwarven Tomb in your deck. Uh, so this is kind of a deceptively simple ally, but I think there's a lot to like here. Only other thing I can think of to add is that for all of these cards that we're talking about that involve leaving play, uh, just consider what kind of effects you can combine with them. Like, if an ally is leaving play, that's a perfectly good opportunity to trigger Valiant Sacrifice, because it doesn't require, you know, allies being destroyed. So, draw some cards, ready some characters, uh, whatever it is that you can throw together, just try to get the, uh, you know, just utmost use out of every possible triggering event. Up next is the event version of the Rittermark's Finest, and that is the one-cost Ride to Ruin. Action, discard a Rohan ally to choose a location. Place three progress on that location. So this is a decent card. Uh, it probably was in my initial iterations of Rohan decks, but it eventually got weaned out in large measure because the Rohan allies are so good and there are very few that I would want to discard. Perhaps the only one that to me would be worth it would be Ailment, who has a benefit from leaving play that's pretty substantial, which is readying all Rohan characters in play. So you can sort of discard him, put three progress, on a location, but also get his ability. So that would be really, really nice. Uh, in general, though, I kind of hate that you have to not only pay one for the event, but also discard an ally. I might be more keen to put this into play or put in my deck if it costs zero, which some similar events later on down the line are zero cost. So I kind of hate the, the double cost here, but it's good. Um, I don't know if it's absolutely necessary. I kind of tend to be, um, my deck building style tends to be similar to Mitch's in that I prefer more allies on the table than I prefer events and attachments and those sorts of things. So this is a case where I'd probably rather use the Rittermark's Finest and just use his ability and pop him, but have that willpower attack for a couple of turns if needed, than to have an event sitting around in my hand forever, you know, until they're is potentially a time where I want to put three progress on a location. And Rohan quests well enough. I think in general you don't need this. Um, but, you know, it's it's a good card. I recognize its power. I don't, you know, I, I don't have any qualms with it, except it's just not in my current deck because I find myself not needing it most of the time. Yeah, uh, certainly there's use here. I just don't necessarily think it's powerful enough. Just like the rear guard is a bit of a bummer because you have to discard a leadership ally this 
lets you target an ally from any sphere of influence, but they have to have that Rohan trait, and it's kind of slim pickings when it comes to that. Like, Snowborn Scout, uh, kind of the universal whipping boy, is a great target for this, but, you know, Horseback Archer costs three, Glaywine costs two, Westfold Horsebreaker is two, Ailmend is three, Escort from Iteros is two, and the Rittermark's Finest is two, and you can't combo the Rittermark's Finest's ability with Ride to Ruin here, so you can't stack discard effects. This isn't like while you're in the process of discarding a Rohan character, so it's like you have to pay the cost of whatever ally, plus the cost of this card, plus you have to have drawn the Rohan ally that you played, plus you have to have drawn this card. And three quest points just isn't that big of a deal. You mentioned that Rohan definitely doesn't flounder when it comes to willpower, as is going to become more and more clear over time. That's kind of their defining characteristic, their most salient feature, is that they're very competent questers. So maybe you could get rid of locations prior to quest resolution, but you're losing allies, and outside of some total emergency, I just can't really see running this card. I mean, it's not the kind of thing that I would ever include in a deck just on uh, the off chance it might be useful, and I kind of have to agree with my former Cardboard of the Rings co-hosts about this one, that it's just not a powerful enough effect to ever really warrant running in a deck outside of some extremely specific uh, uses. So, gotta say, not exactly a fan of this one. Yeah, I think the problem is it's a one-shot. So if you can afford the four resources for Northern Tracker, yeah, that's going to take three turns to do the same thing, but it's more consistent and you get an ally out of the deal if you could potentially ready him or something besides just questing. Uh, in the next cycle, we're going to get another location control card that has basically made every other location control card until this day just pale in comparison uh, to how decent it is. Um and so again, once that's available to players, uh, it's far superior, and it doesn't have nearly the cost that this one does, which makes it frustrating. Again, if this was a zero-cost event, I think it'd be better. Um, because again, location locks are a real thing, particularly in multiplayer games. In fact, it's very problematic in three, uh, particularly four-player games. So being able to snipe a location out of the staging area is very, very powerful. The problem, again, is there are better, easier, cheaper ways to do it most of the time. So I, I don't think it's a bad card. I think it's a decent sideboard card for a Rohan deck, depending on the quest if it's very location heavy. But again, it, it's good, but I don't think it's an auto-include. Well, I will say, Matthew, just because, uh, as I just realized, I'm clearly very, very biased in the direction of uh, just a two-player mindset, mm -hmm. I will say in a three- or four-player game, I could see someone running a card like this one, uh, but it is certainly a bummer that it's not, like, among all the players. Someone has to discard a Rohan ally. It has to be one that you control. It's not a card in your hand. So I'm still not exactly fond of this card, but maybe... Maybe it's a little bit better than I gave it credit for, just because in the Shadows of Mirkwood cycle, location lock is uh, definitely a total nightmare. But enough of these garbagey cards, and let's uh, keep moving along. What does Lore receive? Well, up first is a five-cost ally, Gildor Inglorian. Three willpower, two attack, three defense strength, and three hit points. Gildor is Noldor, and action. Exhaust Gildor and Glorian to look at the top three cards of your deck. Switch one of those cards with a card from your hand, then return the three cards to the top of your deck in any order. Well, wowza, what a beefy ally. I mean, in fact, it's got better stats than some heroes. Um, I have seen people use this card, although... I don't remember anyone ever actually using him for his action, because you have to exhaust him. I mean, he quests so well. He defends so well. He's got a decent amount of hit points. Even his attack is, is reasonable. So, if you can muster up the five lower resources in order to pay for him, I think it's almost like having another hero on the table, even if you never use his ability. So... Probably not a three of copy in your deck unless you're just a fan of this character or something because you're going to draw it and, you know, the other two copies are sort of just sitting around. 
but I definitely think it's a great ally. It'd be like much like Bayorn, super fun if they hit the table, but in most games they're going to sit in your hand while you choose to spend your resources on something else. And that is the problem with this character. Certainly there's a whole hell of a lot of reason to like Gildor. Three willpower is absurd. Three defense, three hit points in the lore sphere. Toss a burning brand on him. Toss self-preservation and uh, baby, you got yourself a stew going. So Gildor (laughs) is fantastic. But like you said, the problem is more often than not, he's going to be sitting there in your hand, not doing anything. You and I are normally pretty strapped for lore resources. And if I manage to get Gildor out in the context of our current card pool, I'm sure as shit not going to be using him for an action. Uh, I like, in a sense, that he can improve the card quality of your hand as opposed to the quantity. Like, I could take a redundant copy of... Uh, Protector of Lorien or Calabrian Stone, and I could uh, put that on the top of my deck in exchange for something more useful in the top three. But outside of some incidental use of his ability, like if Matthew's running Brand and it's like, well, I guess I get to pick a character to ready, why not Gildor? I just cannot envision spending five uh, just to use some sort of effect like this, again, with the card pool that the Shadows of Mirkwood cycle has to offer. He's a great late-game draw because, you know, if you've got a bunch of resources and you want to draw the most powerful thing possible... You can't really go wrong with Gildor, uh, but in the early game, it's likely that he's just going to sit there clogging up your hand, and you're going to be wishing that you had Radagast's Cunning or Secret Paths or anything that's more useful. And uh, even though you can build him up into just an, an almost insurmountable wall with a Burning Brand and those healing effects... I mean, he already costs 5, a burning brand on him makes 7, toss in self-preservation and you're at 10, distributed between 3 cards, so he kind of strikes me as a bit of a win more card. Things have to be going awfully well uh, for you to be able to get him up and online, unless you've got players that are, you know, using Steward of Gondor, Theodrid, to get you as many resources as possible. So... He could be pretty useful, but he definitely doesn't seem like he fits well into every deck, uh, but certainly a hell of a card, and um, I guess you could even combine him with Keen-Eyed Took to have Gildor put some trash on the top of your deck, and then if you've got to return Keen-Eyed Took to hand to discard something, uh, it may as well be your least valuable stuff. So, hell of a character, but... Unfortunately, I I don't necessarily see Gildor getting into play as often as I'd like to uh, benefit from having him on the table. Up next is a three-cost event, Gildor's Council. Play during the quest phase before characters are committed to the quest. Action, reveal one less card from the encounter deck this phase to a minimum of one. This is a really good card, and... I've actually seen it be used, and it was always really nice to, to have it hit the table. Uh, the times I've seen it be used, though, have tended to be times when I'm playing with folks that have a more limited card pool. Maybe they've just gotten into the game and just, you know, they're making decks from the core set, maybe a smattering of the first cycle and some other stuff. But I will say that when I see people build decks that way, and they use cards that I've never seen used or I've never considered, it's always kind of a nice surprise, like, oh yeah, we can actually do this. And... uh So it's a card I actually really like. What I don't particularly like is the cost. However, the encounter deck, for the most part, stinks. And as we get further along in the game, the encounter decks get smaller and more potent. uh, And there are fewer cards that whiff. So in a multiplayer game, going from 4 to 3 or 3 to 2 or, you know, even 2 to 1, I think is really, really good. It doesn't do you any good in a in a solo game, I suppose. But uh, I like it. I wish it was cheaper. But on the flip side, with how powerful this is, you know, if it only cost one or two, it would almost be an auto include. So here you kind of have to debate: is it worth paying three? I think maybe if you're on your final quest push, you're really trying to win. You're precarious in your situation where you've got, I don't know, you know, you're on forty nine threat or something, and you really have to win. This could be a card that really helps you get there. 
Is it a card that I'd want to have three of, you know, clogging up my hand? No, but on the flip side, I, I think it's almost hard to argue its power. I think it's evident, and I think it is powerful. It's just you have to sort of weigh, do I want to spend three resources for this or not? Yeah, there was a lot working against this card when it first came out from my perspective. It's very expensive. It's in the lore sphere, which I don't play a lot of heroes from that sphere, so it's expensive and it's difficult to afford in the first place. Uh, and the quests aren't necessarily so difficult that I feel like I'm getting my money's worth when I'm investing three resources in it, like uh, preventing Enchanted Stream from coming off the encounter deck, a two-threat, two-quest point location. I don't feel that that's worth three resources. I'd much rather be paying for some sort of ally that's going to sit there permanently on the table, always doing something for me. Even if it's not a huge effect, at least it's consistent. Uh, and because Gildor's Council prevents you from revealing a card, uh, like it subtracts one from the total number of cards that you're revealing, even though it's obviously doing something for you, you never actually get to experience like, oh, that stopped me from putting a second hill troll into play, or or, oh, that stopped some enemy coming off the top of the encounter deck that's going to attack me, and I would have theoretically revealed a shadow card that would have caused the enemy to attack again, and it would have created some sort of nightmare cascade that would have cost you the game. It's all kind of theory and uh, conjecture, speculation, so doesn't exactly leave you with a feel-good experience when you play this card, but it is incredibly powerful. Just like Matthew said, the encounter decks only ever stand to get more difficult, and if I could invest an entire turn's worth of resources to prevent some ridiculous enemy from coming off the encounter deck, then that is totally worth it. If I can prevent the encounter deck from triggering some sort of hellish combo that just annihilates me, that's absolutely fantastic as well. So I definitely think this is rather scenario-specific, but here and there, uh, it's definitely worth not underestimating this one. Uh, just like Brand Son of Bane, I think it's very unlikely that a solo player is going to be really enthusiastic about playing this, because most of the time you're not going to get any effect out of it whatsoever. Uh, but I've got to say I do like the Gildor sub-theme of this adventure pack, and uh, even though this doesn't necessarily generate a lot of tempo or momentum for the players, uh, the preventive power behind Gildor's Council here is fantastic. So, very cool card. I'm not sure when it'll start to be worth using, uh, but certainly something always worth considering. And that leads us to our final card. It's another neutral song. It costs one resource, Song of Travel. Attached to a hero, attached hero gains a spirit resource icon. Well, this is perhaps the best of the bunch, although perhaps leadership's good to open up um, Steward of Gondor, but, you know, giving another hero spirit in order to help afford a test of will... Clutch, clutch, clutch. You know, the only thing I'll say is that I don't see anyone use songs anymore, and I haven't for a very long time, because dual sphere or even tri-sphere decks are much more doable these days than they were in the first cycle. But in the first cycle, this was definitely a way to get the best of each sphere uh, and use those cards or to smooth your resources a bit. Even if, you know, let's say you had one spirit hero, now in, in, in effect you have two of them. Uh, and that can be really good. So, I mean, all the songs, my thoughts are the same. They're all good. They're a way to get access to other spheres cards or to help smooth your resources and de facto have one hero that's two spheres. So very, very good. Spirit's always a great option if not for nothing else than test of will. So I like it. Yeah, I mean, maybe someday in the grim darkness of the far future, Song of Travel isn't quite going to be as cool as it is now, uh, but out of all of our songs, I was very much looking forward to this one the most. If our viewers have been paying attention, they've maybe noticed that I tend to play Spirit and Lore decks, and lately, when I'm sitting down and doing a bit of deck building, it seems to be, okay, Barovor plus a couple of uh, Spirit heroes. Maybe Steward of Gondor goes on to Barovor so that I can 
get all sorts of powerful lore cards, like the incredibly expensive Gildor and Glorian into play, but I also want to be able to fund effects like Northern Tracker, Cancel Shadows, Cancel When Revealed effects, and uh, all sorts of good stuff like that. Uh, so, you know, if I can get out Rivendell Minstrel instead of just kind of including other songs in my deck just to thin the deck and uh, uh, expedite my rate of reaching my combo pieces, all of a sudden I'm getting something useful. I can toss Song of Travel onto my Steward of Gondor possessing character, and then I can afford all sorts of card effects that are definitely going to be pushing us through to the end of a scenario. So I think this is very cool. Redundant copies... You know, if anyone is using Eowyn, you can just pitch those to her. And I've got to say, out of all the song cards, this is just uh, very simple artwork, but very beautiful. Just a nice little scenic uh, vista visible through the uh, open portal of a hobbit hole. So beautiful card, very useful card. And, you know, here and there you derive benefit from having attachments affixed to characters and uh, we'll only see more and more synergy with songs eventually. Uh, so I don't know if they hold up years down the road in the modern-day Matthew card pool, uh, but I certainly look forward to building decks with Song of Travel uh, as early as our Hills of Emin Mwil video. But, Matthew, that's pretty much all I can think of to say about our neutral card, uh, what are your overall impressions of the Hills of Emin Muil as an adventure pack? Well, you know, I've gotten shit for this phrase on previous progression series videos, classic progression series, if you will, but this is a mixed bag, and I'm going to stand by that. I think there's some really good cards. Song of Travel, of course, is good for about this cycle, maybe briefly into the next. Gildor, expensive. Doesn't see a ton of play, but I like him. Brittermark's finest, solid if not flashy. Same thing with Descendant of Thorndor, probably more flashy than solid. Um, Rear Guard is one that I actually kind of want to experiment with and, and see how it how it actually plays in reality. And then the hero in multiplayer, I like quite a lot. I think most players uh, would rate this adventure pack as probably the weakest of the cycle, both in terms of the quest itself and the smattering of cards we get with it. Um, I have a more, you know, I think, nuanced opinion of the pack. I do think the quest is horrid and atrocious and the worst of the game, but I know that opinion isn't shared by everybody, uh, though most people, I think, agree. Uh, and the cards, I think, are useful. And having, you know, a much more expanded card pool, a deeper knowledge of the game, I'm a better player now, I think, than I was then, uh, which, you know, you know, take that with a grain of salt. But I do think there are uses for these cards, and they could be very good, uh, so again, not necessarily flashy, but uh, a solid player card pack, I think, all around. I must say it is extraordinarily difficult for me to take off my rose-colored lenses for any cards that have been printed for LOTR LCG, uh, but out of everything we've seen so far, there are certainly a select few cards in this pack that leave a lot to be desired. Uh, Maneldor's Flight, for instance... I can scarcely justify including that in any deck, and the same thing goes for the the poor keen-eyed Took. So there's there is a lot of latent power available in this adventure pack, but uh, not all of it may end up uh, being realized. So I look forward to using some of these cards, uh, but there are certainly some some genuine stinkers in this one. But as always, please let Matthew and I know in the comments what your own thoughts, play experience experiences and perspective is are happens to be on any or all of these cards uh, that's kind of the personal highlight of this series for me is interacting with the community so do you agree with Matthew and I about some of these are we totally wrong about Maneldor's shite or uh, <laughs> any of the others but, Matthew, I think that brings another installment of the Progression series to a close, so as always, please plug your podcast, and then let's steal ourselves for the fan-favorite Shadows of Mirkwood mm. scenario. Uh, I'm bracing myself, but if you'd like to hear more of my thoughts, along with the thoughts of my co-hosts, please check out the Grey Company podcast, which is an in-depth Lord of the Rings LCG podcast focusing on strategy, deck building, and the metagame. 
Well, sounds good. Thank you as always to you, the viewer or listener, for checking out another episode of the Progression Series. Thank you to you, Matthew, for tolerating me for another hour or so. Uh, be sure to check in next time for when Matthew and I explore the hills of Emin Wheel. If you want to get in touch with me, I'm the Hive Tyrant on Twitter or Facebook. If you'd like to make a contribution to support the ongoing progression series, I have a Patreon account as well. But as always, thank you so much for watching or listening, and be sure to check back in again soon for more LOTR LCG content to come.